Have you ever wondered how we're going to communicate with machines in the future? Or how they might communicate with us? Join me as we discover a world of chips with everything. Welcome to Chips With Everything. Tonight, we're going to look at the extraordinary way in which computers have influenced almost every aspect of our lives. Now, I'd like to start by finding out how many computers you have at home. If you have no computers, I want you to press button A. If you have between 1 and 5, you can press button B. If you have between 6 and 10, you can press C. And if you have more than 10 computers at home, you can press button D. Okay, I'd like you all to press your buttons now, please. Okay, and we bring up the results, and it looks as if most of you have between one and five computers at home. Well, that's interesting. It may surprise you then to know that the average UK household today has over 100 computers. Computing is undergoing a transformation from a box on your desktop to a world in which computers are built into all sorts of everyday objects, from washing machines to thermostats and from televisions to toys. Every year, 100 million new microprocessors are made for desktop and laptop computers, but around 100 times as many as that are made for these embedded applications. And we're just at the beginning of this revolution. Now, perhaps the most important example of an embedded computer is the mobile phone. Now, of course, originally, the mobile phone was developed for audio communication. And we have here a clip from the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures back in 1985. <laughs> Find the phone under your seat there that's ringing. OK? Would you like to press the orange button, please? It'll take the call and then use it as an ordinary phone. Hold it up to your ear. Hello? Can you hear me on the phone? Very clearly. Good. Can you tell me your name, please? Natural Charles Lovell Hall. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the sort of phone that was being used in that clip. I'm actually delighted to say that Max has joined us this evening. So, Max, welcome back to the Christmas Lectures. <laughs> I expect you have a rather smaller phone these days, do you? Yep, somewhat. <laughs> OK, excellent. Very Thank tiny. you very much. Well, before the digital revolution, information technology came in lots of separate packages like this got a dictionary, and this uh, thing here, this is called a typewriter, in case you've not seen one of those before, and we've got a globe and a radio and so on. Well, today, the work of all these items and many more can all be done by a single device. And this is possible because the mobile phone is really a computer. Now, people aren't just carrying computers around in their pockets, they're also beginning to wear them. And here's Wendy, she's wearing lots of different computers, here, if we just turn around a little bit. Here she has a Bluetooth earpiece so she can chat to her friends while she's jogging. She has, uh, just turn around again, a heart rate monitor, uh, a GPS on her wristwatch. And uh, on her running shoes, she has a small computer that's measuring her running pace. Now, she's also wearing this. This is called a sense cam. It's a type of camera, and it has a wide-angle lens. And it takes a photograph every time it detects a change in light level or movement. Now we can see the results of this. This is a little video made by Andy when he was wearing the sense cam. He and Lewis were busy building props for this lecture. So here they are cycling off to the electronics shop and they're buying some components and here they are cycling back to the Royal Institution to get on with those props. 
Well, the sense cam then is a fun way to record an event, such as a family day out, and it's also been found useful for people with certain kinds of memory loss, things like Alzheimer's. They can review their day's events, and it just helps them to remember what's happened. OK, thank you, Wendy. Now, the sense cam helps us with our memory, but could computers also improve our senses? Well, I'm going to show you something now which I think is actually very remarkable. This is a video of a little girl called Tara, and this is taken when she was just three years old. As you can see, she's learning to use sign language. Yes, good girl. Car. Ah. Uh, Car. Uh, Good girl. Now, Tara is completely deaf. She can't understand speech. But also, she can't learn to speak because she can't hear the sound of her own voice. That's this one. You can sit down. Sit down. That's a good girl. Right. Birthday cake. One. Birthday cake. Well, we can understand the reason for Tara's deafness by having a look at this model of the ear. Now, of course, this is the part on the outside that collects the sound. The sound passes inside, where it's sent through some little bones to this organ here. And this spiral-shaped organ is called the cochlea. Now, the cochlea takes the vibrations of the sound waves and turns them into electrical signals, which are then sent along this nerve fibre to the brain. Now, in Tara's case, the cochlea was damaged, but the nerve was still working correctly. And so a surgeon inserted a special device into Tara's cochlea. Now, this is the part of the device that goes on the outside. So... This part here is worn over the ear and it has a little microphone and this is a little transmitter. And then on the inside, there's a, a receiver and a little computer processor chip which then sends signals along a little fibre to some electrodes. And here we have a little X-ray video showing these electrodes being inserted. Here's the spiral shape of the cochlea. Each of these is one of the electrodes. And you can see the wires that lead from the electrodes back out to the computer processor. Now, we can see how that works by looking at this demonstration. Inside this box are some electronics which are just the same as the electronics inside the implant. So you can see, again, the spiral shape of the cochlea. And each of these green circles represents one of the electrodes. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play a tone that will start off at a low pitch and it will gradually increase in pitch. And what we should see is that the low frequencies are sent to the small inner region of the cochlea and the high frequencies go to the large outer region. So let's just play that tone and see if we can see that. Okay. Well, it was 10 years ago that Tara received her implant and to see what effect this has had, could you please give a very special Royal Institution welcome to Tara. <laughs> Tara, welcome to the Christmas Lectures. What's the implant meant to you then? Well, this um, implant has helped me hear and respond to conversations and help me hear. And it's really helped us so far. Fantastic. I mean, you seem to be able to speak wonderfully. It's amazing. Yeah. And are there situations where it's harder to, to hear what people are saying? Um, yeah, with the background. And it makes me work harder, but it's right. great to have a cochlear implant. Brilliant. And do you listen to music at all? I do as well. And my favourite band is JLS. Oh, right. OK. Well, the surgeon who performed this extraordinary operation, his name's Roger Gray. And uh, Roger is sat up there in the balcony. Hello, Roger. Welcome. <laughs> Well, Tara, Tara, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Well, I think that really is an extraordinary example of the power of digital technology. Now, after the break, we're going to be looking at the way we can build computers into all kinds of everyday objects, and we'll be giving them some exciting new capabilities. So join me then.
as more and more computers are built into everyday objects, our goal is for these to be invisible and to be so easy to use that you don't even realise you're using a computer. But how are we going to interact with all these computers? Obviously, we don't want hundreds of keyboards everywhere. Well, let's start by seeing what happens when we build a computer into a common object such as a table. And for this, I'll need a volunteer. Let's take somebody from this side. I think, yes, I think you're, you seem very keen. Why don't you come on down? Yes, you. Come on. I'd like to just come and stand over there. All right, so if you'd like to stand there. And what's your name? Emily. Emily. Right, Emily, what I'd like you to do is just to take the fingers and thumbs of one hand and just place it on this table and sweep it around and see what happens. Isn't that nice? Yeah. OK, let me show you something else then. So this is uh, a little painting game. So what I'm going to do is select a colour for you. In fact, let's do this. OK, now take fingers and thumbs of both hands, put them on the surface and just try doing a little bit of painting for me. That's excellent. So we can see that this is a touch-sensitive screen, but it's a special kind of touch-sensitive screen because it can detect touch from multiple fingers at the same time. We call it a multi-touch display. But as well as detecting touch from fingers, it can also detect the presence of physical objects. So here I have what look like ordinary little squares of glass. So you can see it's just completely transparent. But if I put this on the table, we'll see something interesting happening. It becomes a little piece of a jigsaw puzzle, but a rather unusual one because it's a video jigsaw puzzle. So here are some more pieces of the video jigsaw. So, Emily, would you like to have a little go? And we'll see if we can assemble this jigsaw. Let's see if you can fit some pieces together. That's good. And if you want to play with this video jigsaw, you can find a simulation of it on the website which accompanies this year's Christmas lectures. That's good. Slide the last You've piece completed in. the puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Excellent. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, that was impressive. So, how does this actually work? Well, inside the box here, we have a projector, and the projector is projecting images onto the screen, and that's that's all fairly standard. But also inside the box are some special lights that produce infrared light. And that's light that can't be seen by the human eye. But there's a camera in there which can detect infrared. And it uses an effect that you may already have seen before, and it's this. What I have here is a piece of the plastic that's used to make that screen. I'm just going to hold it up against some white light. And you'll see that if I put my hand behind it, all you can see is a, a sort of vague shadow of my hand. But if I touch the plastic, if I touch the plastic there, you can see my fingertips very clearly. And so the infrared camera is able to detect those. And those video jigsaw pieces, inside each of these is a special little code that can only be seen with infrared light. And each piece has its own code, so the computer knows which piece is which and which way up it goes. Now, the most common form of computer display these days, by far, is called the liquid crystal display, or the LCD. And in fact, this screen behind me is an example of an LCD screen. So how does a liquid crystal display work? Well, we can find out by doing an experiment, and for this I'll need a volunteer. So let me take somebody from this side. OK, should we have you? Yes? No? No, in front. Yes, you. Come on. <laughs> Come and stand here. And what's your name? My name's Sarah. Sarah. All right, Sarah. Now, the other thing I'm going to need is uh, a nice, cool, trendy pair of sunglasses. Has anybody got some cool shades? <laughs> hey, Andy, can I borrow the lenses from your sunglasses? Okay, thanks, Andy. Brilliant. Okay. Oh, 
Ah, oh, you don't look so cool now, do you? <laughs> so these are the lenses from a pair of sunglasses. What I'd like you to do is if you could just look straight into that camera for me and just hold that in front of your face like that, okay? I'll just tilt it forward slightly so we get a reflection, that's good. Okay, so we can see that this is, you're making your face just slightly darker because of the dark plastic. And if I put another one in front, we'll see it doesn't really make very much difference. But now look what happens if I rotate this through 90 degrees. And if I carry on rotating, so that blocks the light, and if I carry on rotating, the light gets through again. Okay, now when you all came in this evening, you should have received some little blue envelopes. If you'd like to open those blue envelopes, and inside you'll find two little plastic squares. Now those little plastic squares are made of the same material as these sunglasses. So if you hold one of them in front of the other, and just look at the white screen up there, when you rotate them, you'll see that they first of all block out the light, and if you keep rotating, you'll be able to see the light again. Okay, so this is an amazing effect, but what's it got to do with liquid crystal displays? Well, if I take one of these lenses and I hold it up in front of this display, if I rotate the lens, you'll see again the display goes dark. So that's an amazing effect, but what's actually going on there? Well, if you'd like to just come over here with me, we're going to do another little experiment, if you'd like to come and stand about there. So we have to understand why light gets blocked when we rotate those polarizers. Now light is a kind of wave, we call it an electromagnetic wave, and this machine will simulate wave motion. So what I'd like you to do is just crouch down here with me. All I want you to do is to move this up and down, nice and slowly, nice big slow movements. You got that? Keep hold of it. Okay, keep going. Nice big slow movements. Okay, and that's sending a wave down the machine that's a bit like a light wave. All right. Now what I have here are some models of polarizers. Thank you very much. These are just sheets of plastic with slots cut into them. So I'm just going to place these over the machine, like this, one there, and one there. And notice they have the same orientation, they're both vertical. Okay, if you'd like to send a wave down the machine then, please. And that wave is passing through the first polarizer, and then through the second polarizer. That's it, nice, keep going, nice big sweeping movement. So the waves are going all the way down to the end. Okay, just stop for a moment. What I'm going to do now is take one of these polarizers and rotate it through 90 degrees and then put it back again. So if you'd like to send another wave down the machine. So again, the wave is passing through the first polarizer, but this time it's getting blocked. So the wave doesn't make it all the way to the end of the machine. And that's what's going on with those plastic polarizers. OK, thank you very much. So we've seen how polarizers work, but how can we use polarizers to make a display? Well, I'm going to take these plastic polarizers and mount them in these stands at right angles to each other so the light is blocked. Good. Here I have a box containing sugar solution. It's just ordinary table sugar dissolved in water. Let's see what happens when we slide this in between those crossed polarizers. Okay, so it now allows light to get through. What's happening is that the sugar molecules are rotating the direction of polarization. So the light passes through the first polarizer, is rotated, and can then pass through the second polarizer. OK, you can take that out now. Thank you. Now, if we were to use that to make a display, we need some way of controlling that rotation electrically. And we can do that like this. I have here two pieces of glass. They've been covered in some transparent electrodes. And then sandwiched between the glass is special material called liquid crystal. And I have another one of these here mounted in a stand. And on the other side of the stand, you can see we've attached some wires and we've connected it through to a power supply. So let's see what happens when we place this liquid crystal between the two polarizers. 
So again, we see it allows light to go through. The liquid crystal is rotating the direction of polarization of light. Now let's see what happens when we apply a voltage between those two sheets of glass. Is that nice? So what's happening there is that the liquid crystal molecules are normally twisted, and that's what causes this rotation of polarization. But when we apply a voltage, the crystals untwist, and they no longer rotate the direction of polarization, and therefore the light is blocked by the second polarizer. And if I take the display out, I'm not going to switch it off, I'm just going to slide it out, and you'll see without the polarizers, it just looks like a plain piece of glass. So we've seen how to control the level of white light getting through a screen. But how can we use this to produce a full color display? Well, in front of this liquid crystal panel, we've mounted a lens. And if we can bring up a, a white light display on the screen and then zoom in on this region, we can just see some little squares. If we can bring up a, a magnification of that on the screen itself, so we can see that the screen is made of tiny little squares, and they're different colors. They're, some are red, some are green, and some are blue. Now, this makes use of an important property of human vision. And to demonstrate this, I'll need a volunteer who'd like to volunteer. Uh, so we have you. Yes, you. <laughs> really is you. <laughs> <clears throat> If you'd, if you'd like to come and stand around here. And what's your name? Uh, Hugh. Hugh. Okay, Hugh, what I'd like you to do is take this red slider and just slide it up to the top there for me. That's good. And on the screen up there, we can see it's brought up some red light. Okay. Do the same thing with the green slider. Bring that one up to the top. And that's brought up some green light. And you can see where the green and the red light overlap, it makes yellow. Okay, try taking the green slider back down to the bottom. That's good. And now bring up the blue slider. Okay, so we now have a mixture of red and blue. And where they overlap, we get a purpley color. That's called magenta. Okay, let's bring up the green slider to the top now. So we've got red and blue and green. That's it, all the way to the top. And now, where the red and the green and the blue overlap, we get white light. And in fact, we can make any color we like by taking the right mixture of red and green and blue. And we do this on a liquid crystal display by having little red, green and blue filters in front of each of those pixels. Of course, when we stand back from the display, we don't see the little pixels. Our eye blends it all together into one color. OK, thank you very much. So we've seen that liquid crystal displays work by sending light through crossed polarizers, and they use liquid crystals to control the amount of light that gets transmitted. Now, a disadvantage of this way of making a display is that it wastes a lot of light in the polarizers, in the filters, and also in the dark pixels. Now, a few years ago, it was discovered that certain plastics can actually emit light when you apply a voltage to them. They're called organic light-emitting diodes. And I have a display here that's made from this material. And what's interesting about it is that it just looks like a transparent piece of plastic, and it's completely flexible. But you'll see, if I apply a voltage to it, it emits light. And I can even flex the display while it's working. Another interesting thing about this kind of display is that it can be made by a process that's very much like an inkjet printer. And in the future, that may allow us to print displays onto things like boxes or even onto clothing, T-shirts and that sort of thing. So all the displays that we've seen so far are two-dimensional. And of course, they produce two-dimensional images. But the real world is three-dimensional. Can we produce a display that can produce three-dimensional images? Well, to find out, join me after the break. Display technologies are currently undergoing a revolution. And one of the many exciting challenges is how to produce three-dimensional displays. Well, here I have a step towards a three-dimensional display. It's actually a spherical display. 
and at the moment it's showing a globe. But what's special about this display is that it supports touch. In fact, it's a multi-touch display, so I can spin the globe around. And uh, what have we got? This looks like the Middle East. There's Africa. So the, uh, the Royal Institution is up here somewhere. But of course, unlike a regular globe, I can spin this around in different directions. So we can take a look at Antarctica. And uh, it's surprising just how enormous Antarctica actually is. Now, something else we can do with this display is this. I have here a special type of camera. It actually has five separate little cameras here looking outwards through mirrors. And special software can stitch these images together to make a single continuous 360 degree panorama. Now we have an identical camera to this positioned just outside the lecture theatre where we have seven volunteers huddled around the camera. So we're going to bring that panoramic display uh, up on this spherical surface here. And uh, uh, can you hear me out there? Could you all wave if you can hear me? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's see, what have we got here? There's a young lady in a blue top with a necklace. Can you wave? Can you wave? Yes, that's you. What's your name? Alex. Alex. All right, welcome, Alex. Who else have we got? Uh, let's go around a little bit further. Oh, there's another young lady with a blue, with a blue shirt on and a necklace. Hello. Yes, that's you. Yes. <laughs> What's your name? Jay. Jay. Okay, welcome. Well, if you'd all like to come back into the lecture theatre now, please. So the sphere is good for displaying certain kinds of information, but if you want a truly three-dimensional display, it would allow us to look around objects as we move our head from side to side. So could we achieve that using a standard liquid crystal display? Well, to find out, I'd like a volunteer, please. Who'd like to come on down? Um, let's have, yes, would you like to come down? Stand here. What's your name? Owen. Owen. All right, Owen. What we've got here is a special hat for you to put on. So if you'd like, just like to stand still there, and I'll help you fit this on your head. Put that on your, on your head. Can you do that strap up? Yep. Got it done? Okay, yep. excellent. Now on this hat, we have the tracking bar from a Wii games console. So in each end is a special light that emits infrared. We've also positioned a camera on top of the hat. Now, the camera is nothing to do with the demonstration. It's just so that we can see what Owen is seeing from his point of view. Right, if you'd like to turn around, what we have here is a standard liquid crystal display, but underneath we've mounted a camera that can detect infrared. In fact, this is just the remote control from a Wii games console. We've sort of swapped the remote and the, the tracking bar over. Now, I'm going to switch on the tracking bar, and if you'd like to just move your head from side to side like that and just keep looking at the screen but just move your move your body that's it try bending your knees slightly and dipping down good and move just toward can you see that three-dimensional effect it looks like you're looking inside the sort of three-dimensional room you see that effect there okay excellent okay thank you very much So this achieves a three-dimensional effect by using a standard display. But of course, it requires the user to wear this special hat. And also, only one person at a time can see the three-dimensional effect. What I'm going to show you now is a new kind of display that achieves something very close to a truly three-dimensional image. And this is the only display of its kind in Europe. And I have the display over here. And what this is showing is a video taken from a medical scanner. And it's all sort of transparent. If you can see in through this with a close-up camera, you can see the blue at the back there is the spinal column. And either side, the yellow are the lungs. And at the base of the lungs, you can see it moving up and down. That's the diaphragm moving up and down as this person is breathing. Now, what's really special about this display, if we can get the camera in to have a look at this, is that if we just walk around this display and look at it from different points of view, you can see that it's actually three-dimensional. It's a three-dimensional, transparent movie suspended in mid-air. OK, so how does this work? Well, to see how it works, I'm going to just switch off the display. And we'll just wait a moment while it slows down. 
So inside the cabinet here, we have a projector. And the projector sends images up and bounces them off a mirror, and they're projected onto this screen, which we can see slowly rotating as it comes to a halt. That projector is sending 6,000 images a second onto this screen. And each of those images is timed very carefully according to the orientation of the screen. So it's throwing out a different image in each direction, which means that as you walk around the display, you get this impression of a three-dimensional object sitting in midair. So we've seen some amazing examples of display technologies, but remember we said earlier that the goal is to make computers so easy to use that you don't even think about it. Well, in fact, we're often already using computers without even realizing it. For example, computers are now built into toys, and each of these lovely little robots has a fully-fledged programmable computer inside. And on a good day, they all dance at the same time. <laughs> They're doing pretty well, actually. Now, here's another example of a computer. This is a credit card, and behind these gold contacts is a tiny microprocessor chip embedded into the plastic. I have some examples of these chips here. Each of these is one of the processes from a credit card. You can see the, the tiny gold contacts. And if I turn it over, underneath, you can see the individual chips. Now, these may not look like much, but at the end of the 1960s, the Apollo astronauts went to the moon, and they used a special computer to guide them to the moon and to make the landing. Well, each of these tiny processes has 30 times the processing power and 100 times the memory of the Apollo guidance computer. Even tinier devices can also be made. And I have a demonstration here for which I'd like a volunteer, please. Shall we have... Oh, my goodness, everybody wants to volunteer. Shall we have you? Would you like to come on down? Yes, in the blue top. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, what's your name? Anna. Anna. OK. Well, imagine that um, you're going to do a little bit of shopping here. So we've got some things in a shop that you might wish to buy. What I'm going to do is give you a, a shopping basket. I'd like you to just pick out four or five things that, that, that take your fancy, anything that interests you there. So we've got some few biscuits and a packet of sweets, water bottle. Any one or two other things? What's that? Looks like an apron. Um, anything else? A pair of socks? OK, that's excellent. So if you'd like to hang on there for a minute. Now, over here at the checkout, we have a, a scanner, and the scanner is connected to this uh, computer. So if you'd like to bring the basket over and just place it on the scanner, that's excellent. And those objects that you've just selected appear on the screen here. So there's the, there's the bottle, the biscuits, and there's the socks, and so on. Now, how does this work? For the purposes of this demonstration, we've added to each of these items a tiny silicon chip. You may be able to see it here. Uh, this is actually the antenna, and the processor is in the middle. And this is called a radio frequency identification tag, or an RFID tag. And the scanner detects the presence of this tag, and the tag sends a little signal to the computer with a unique number on it. And the computer looks up that number in the database, and it knows what object that corresponds to. And if we just click on one of these, uh, let's click on that uh, box of biscuits, and it brings up information. It tells us um, uh, the country it was made in. This is made in Scotland, and the date of manufacture, and the best before date, and so on. Now, the interesting thing about these tags is that unlike a barcode, they give a unique identity to this specific packet of biscuits. So this allows objects to be tracked from the factory in which they're made to the shop in which they're sold. An intelligent fridge could detect whether something is out of date. And when we throw the packaging away, an intelligent recycling plant could work out what material it's made from and how best to recycle it. But just how small could we go? Well, I'm going to show you something now that's very new and I think quite extraordinary. Thanks, Anna. So in this little tube, I have some powder. And if I just turn it, it should just be catching the light there. In this tube are 10,000 tiny silicon chips, each of which is a 20th of a millimeter across 
and cost around a penny to produce. These are radio frequency identification tags and each one has its own unique number. Now there are about 300 trillion, trillion, trillion different possible numbers. And that's enough for us to label every single object that's ever produced, from a bicycle to a simple sheet of paper. Now that truly would be chips with everything. Now these devices just transmit their identity. But imagine a world in which fully-fledged computers are as tiny and as cheap as these. In which they can sense their environment, in which they can communicate with each other, as well as with computers on the internet. Combining information and making decisions on our behalf automatically. Well, such a world is not far away. Now all this, of course, is made possible by the extraordinary technology of the microprocessor. But there's something else that's crucial as well. 50 years ago, each piece of information technology came in its own separate package with its own hardware. But today, all of these tasks are combined into a single piece of hardware. And it's an extraordinary thing called software that allows a single device to be turned into a camera or a dictionary or a telephone or a game. We'll be looking at the amazing world of software in tomorrow's lecture. Thank you.